Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about enzymes. So enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions. During the reaction, the enzyme is not changed in any way, nor does it change the reaction in any way. In fact, enzymes are referred to as simply catalysts. So what we can see is enzymes actually take the reactants and they precede the reaction towards the products. And what they do is they actually speed up the reaction by lowering the activation energy. So in a typical reaction, we can see that the activation energy is quite large, uh, but in an enzymatic catalyzed reaction, the activation energy can be smaller. And so what it does is it speeds up the reaction by lowering the amount of energy that it actually takes. Without enzymes, most reactions would be too slow uh, within, the se within a cell and we'd be unable to live. Uh, the enzyme basically participates with the reactants to produce the final products. So it would look something like this. So in a typical enzymatic reaction, you would have substrates or the reactants And those substrates would interact with the enzyme at a location called the active site. And so the substrate would fit into the active site. And if this is the other substrate, it would fit into the active site. And then the enzyme would help to speed up the reaction, catalyze the reaction, so that eventually you can produce products. But notice that the enzyme isn't changed. So this is what the enzyme looks like at the beginning of the reaction. And this is what the enzyme looks at the end of the reaction. But what has changed is the reactants have changed, the substrates have changed as we produce new products. So enzymes speed up the reaction, they lower the activation energy, but they don't change what the reaction is going to do. So in this scenario, A plus B becomes C plus D. And, and that reaction is going to be the same whether the enzyme is there or whether the enzyme is not there. The enzyme just simply makes this reaction faster. And it does it by lowering that activation energy. So the reactants, oftentimes called the substrates, are interacting with active sites so that the reactions can go faster. Uh, this is oftentimes, oftentimes referred to as the lock and key model. So when you have a key, a key fits into a specific location or a specific lock, just like substrates fit into specific active sites. And so the lock-in key model or induced fit model uh, is oftentimes used to describe what's happening in enzymatic reactions. This is an example of the idea of an induced fit model where you have an active site or multiple active sites and perhaps the substrate doesn't fit exactly into that location. So something has to happen to the enzyme, to the protein, in order for the uh, substrates, so these are the substrates, uh, to actually fit into the active sites. And so we have to have a conformational shape change uh, in order for an induced fit to take place. And we'll see later on that things like cofactors oftentimes can assist in making the active site available to the substrates so that the enzymes uh, can actually do their job and speed up the reaction. So most enzymes uh, are protein based, so they're typically large uh, proteins. Uh, there are some examples of RNA enzymes, uh, but for the most part, we talk about protein based uh, enzymes when we discuss uh, human physiology. When talking about uh, enzymes, it's important to think about the idea of specificity, <clears throat> competition, and saturation. Uh, specificity uh, is really talking about how an enzyme uh, will catalyze a certain type of reaction. Uh, so when you look at uh, names of enzymes, so for example on this diagram, you'll notice that certain enzymes do certain things. So amylase uh, is actually a particular enzyme 
uh, that is used in carbohydrate digestion. So you'll see terms like salivary amylase or pancreatic amylase. Um, and amylase refers to the specificity of that particular uh, enzyme uh, for its ability to break down carbohydrates. Uh, creatine kinase uh, is going to be involved uh, in uh, creatine phosphate metabolism. So in, in muscle activity, when we talk about ATP production, uh, there's a specific enzyme for creatine phosphate metabolism. Uh, lactate dehydrogenase, another good example because it's got lactate in the name. Uh, that one is very specific for uh, lactic acid metabolism. And some other examples would be things like maltase for the breakdown of maltose, uh, sucrase for the breakdown of sucrose, lactase for the breakdown of lactose. Uh, so enzymes have uh, usually very specific roles uh, to play in the body uh, and they have uh, specificity to the substrates that they interact with. There's also this idea of competition uh, that takes place uh, oftentimes with enzymes. When you have uh, substrates that mimic uh, the reactants uh, in a reaction, those substrates would be referred to as agonists. And so agonists can interact with uh, the active site of an enzyme, and that can provide uh, what we call competition uh, for the active site. So if there's multiple substrates trying to interact with a particular enzyme, that could actually slow down uh, the activity uh, of that particular enzyme, or it could lead to a situation where you're producing more products if multiple types of substrates can interact with the same active site. On the other hand, there, there are substrates that we call antagonists, um, and antagonistic substrates typically uh, will decrease the activity of an enzyme. So they'll bind into uh, the active site and actually slow down the activity. <clears throat> then there's the idea of saturation. So I want to jump ahead here and look at saturation, a couple different diagrams. <clears throat> so in the idea of saturation, what we're talking about is that when you essentially run out of the enzyme available for the reaction, you're going to reach a point at which the reaction can't go any faster. So actually, let's take a look at this diagram. So in this example, when you have plenty of protein concentration, or in this case, enzyme, when there's plenty of enzyme and you have uh, basically um, an adequate supply of substrate, then the reaction rate can continue to increase. As long as you add in substrate and as long as you have uh, the appropriate amount of enzyme, the reaction can continue to proceed uh, at a faster and faster rate. But when you get to a point, so in this diagram, when you get to a point where you essentially run out of enzyme, so let's say that we get to this point here and we're not adding any more enzyme into uh, the reaction, then no matter how much more substrate you add to the situation, if the enzyme is a fixed number, if, there, if it's a fixed amount of enzyme, it doesn't matter if you keep increasing the substrate. So here we're talking about substrate. The response rate is going to plateau. So if I have a hundred enzymes and I have a thousand substrates, you can only interact with 100 substrates at a time with the 100 enzymes that you have available. And so you've reached a point of saturation. So it doesn't matter if I keep increasing the substrate because I'm limited by the amount of enzyme that's available. So if you wanted to make this particular reaction go faster, you would have to increase the amount of enzyme available. And that would require the cell to actually produce, right, to increase its production of enzyme. So if cells want reactions to go faster, Right? If, the, if the body needs a reaction to go faster, we're going to have to increase production of enzymes 
<clears throat> because there is this saturation point that can be met. <clears throat> so no matter how many more substrates you have, <clears throat> you can't make the reaction go any faster. Um, I wanna go back to some previous uh, diagrams. <clears throat> I, I like this particular one <clears throat> because it talks about the idea <clears throat> of using enzymes for diagnostic purposes. So some enzymes, uh, turns out uh, they have uh, related forms. <clears throat> They're what we call isoenzymes. So isoenzymes um, actually catalyze the same reaction. <clears throat> they just do it in different locations of the body. <clears throat> for example, the enzyme uh, lactate dehydrogenase <clears throat> can actually be found uh, in tissue specific locations. <clears throat> so for example, there's a lactate dehydrogenase in the heart, there's a lactate dehydrogenase in skeletal muscle. Uh, there's a different version in the liver. <clears throat> so all of these are lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, they're just called isozymes of each other. They're, they're different versions of the same enzyme found in different locations of the body. <clears throat> and that can be used for uh, diagnostic purposes. Uh, if a particular LDH shows up in your blood, so let's say we find lactate dehydrogenase uh, in the blood, and it turns out that that particular lactate dehydrogenase is from the heart, then we can determine that myocardial infarction has taken place. <clears throat> that means heart cells uh, have died, <clears throat> ruptured, and they've released that LDH uh, into the bloodstream. If we find LDH <clears throat> from skeletal muscle <clears throat> in the blood, then that tells us that we're dealing with a skeletal muscle pathology and not a cardiac muscle pathology. <clears throat> so isozymes are actually really good uh, at helping us to determine where in the body <clears throat> there is a pathology taking place. Uh, creatine uh, kinase or creatine phosphokinase, <clears throat> CPK or just CK, uh, is another good example of an isozyme. Uh, there's creatine phosphokinase uh, in the heart, there's creatine phosphokinase in skeletal muscle, <clears throat> and so again, depending upon which CPK shows up in the blood. <clears throat> so if you find creatine phosphokinase in the blood <clears throat> and you determine that it is the skeletal uh, muscle version, <clears throat> so it's the skeletal muscle uh, isozyme, <clears throat> then you know that you're dealing with a skeletal muscle uh, pathology, maybe something like muscular dystrophy. If it was the CPK from the heart, again, we could go back and infer that we have myocardial infarction, right? We have a pathology of cardiac muscle. <clears throat> so isozymes are actually uh, really good and used in uh, uh, medical uh, diagnosis <clears throat> because we can find different versions of these enzymes in different locations of the body. <clears throat> um, enzymes are, are affected <clears throat> by various conditions. And so the rate uh, at which an enzyme does its job is actually affected by things like temperature, uh, pH, cofactors, coenzymes, um, end product inhibition, um, how much substrate is present. We looked at that in saturation. <clears throat> how much substrate is present in relationship to how much enzyme is available. <clears throat> so all these things can affect the activity of enzymes. So let's take a look first at the effects of temperature. So the rate of a reaction will increase when the temperature increases. So looking at this particular uh, diagram, we can see that the rate of a reaction is increasing as temperature is increasing. You'll notice though that there's a plateau. So there's a point at which the reaction rate uh, doesn't go any faster. For the human body, we notice that that plateau is around 37 degrees Celsius because 37 degrees C is normal body temperature. So our enzymes will see an increase in reaction rate up to a plateau point, which is typically around that 37 degrees Celsius. So as enzymes get cooler, reaction rates go down. As enzymes get warmer, reaction rates go faster. But you'll also notice that the reaction rate can drop off considerably and actually go all the way down to no rate at all if the temperatures get too high. So when, when um, body temperature uh, rises too rapidly, 
uh, for example, in a situation that we call fever, <clears throat> there is the potential for enzymes to denature. And what a denatured protein is, is a protein that unfolds. And when that protein unfolds, it's no longer functional. So what we know about temperature <clears throat> is that enzymes in the human body have an optimal temperature of 37 degrees C. We know that if temperature decreases, reaction rate decreases. We know that when temperatures increase, reaction rate increases up to a plateau point. But if we get too hot, then we know that we can experience a denaturing effect. And when enzymes denature, you can't undo that. So once they unfold, think of like cooking an egg. Once you cook that egg and you unfold the proteins, you can't put them back together uh, in the original form that they were in. So denaturing takes place uh, and that can actually uh, lead to problems in functionality in the body. So as we unfold enzymes, we can see uh, obviously metabolic activities being affected. And so we can see neurological defects, seizures, uh, and those kinds of things manifesting as symptoms uh, because we are no longer having functional enzymes working in our cells because they are unfolding and they are going through a denaturization process. Uh, pH also affects enzymatic activity. Um, it turns out that pH has a denaturing effect as well. So pH can denature. So it turns out that enzymes have optimal pHs. And so each enzyme in the body exhibits an optimal pH. Um, in this particular example, you can see that the optimum, this plateau, uh, is around 7.4 pH. Uh, that turns out to be uh, the normal blood pH. So 7.4 is normal blood pH. Uh, but we also see a pH of 7 in other locations in the body. <clears throat> so for example, um, the, our saliva uh, is around a neutral or 7 pH. <clears throat> so any enzymes that work uh, in our saliva, like salivary amylase, are going to work at that optimum of about pH of 7. <clears throat> enzymes that work in our blood are going to work at a pH of around 7.4 because <clears throat> that's the optimal activity. But the pH optimum reflects the body fluid that you're in. <clears throat> so this example <clears throat> is nice because it shows you enzymes that work at different pH optimums. <clears throat> so salivary amylase, notice, is peaking around 7 because saliva has a pH of about 7. Trypsin, which is a protein digesting enzyme from the pancreas, so this comes from the pancreas, uh, it has a pH optimum of around 9, 9 to 9.5. So again, it's plateauing in an environment that is optimal for that enzyme. Uh, why is trypsin higher than uh, just normal pH uh, or neutral pH of 7? Well, we actually dump large amounts of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is an ion that works as a buffer. We dump a lot of that bicarbonate into the small intestine because the stomach empties acids into the small intestine and we need to buffer those acids that come out of the stomach. So if you're dumping bicarbonate and making the uh, pH more alkaline, any enzymes that are going to work in the small intestine need to be more functional at an alkaline pH. So trypsin coming from the pancreas gets dumped into the small intestine, just like bicarbonate is getting dumped into the small intestine. And so it needs to work at that optimal uh, nine, uh, nine and a half uh, pH range. And so you'll notice activity drops when the pH is not optimum. So you see a decrease in trypsin activity. You'll see a decrease in amylase activity when it's not the pH optimum. Notice when you swallow uh, saliva and you have a pH in the stomach of around 2. Okay, so this would be the stomach. Amylase isn't going to work. Salivary amylase isn't going to work at that pH because it's way outside of the normal range for it. So 
the pH optimum reflects the body fluid, <clears throat> which brings us to pepsin. Pepsin is also a protein digesting enzyme. It's produced in the stomach. <clears throat> and notice that its pH optimum is a pH of two <clears throat> because the stomach has gastric juices uh, and there's hydrochloric acid <clears throat> in that gastric juice. So the stomach is acidic, and so therefore the optimum for pepsin <clears throat> is to be at an acidic uh, pH. So if the pH changes, <clears throat> we can see that enzymatic activity will, will decrease <clears throat> if it's away from the optimum. And then uh, pH is important <clears throat> because it affects other uh, proteins within the body and other enzymes within the body. And again, when they're outside of the normal pH, you oftentimes see denaturization taking place, just like we saw with temperature. So it's very important to have the right temperature and the right pH. What about enzymatic um, or enzyme uh, and substrate concentration? And how does that affect activity? So at specific enzyme concentrations, the rate of product formation is going to increase as the substrate increases. <clears throat> so when you have adequate amounts of enzyme <clears throat> and, there, and then there's adequate amounts of substrate, <clears throat> you can see the reaction rate increasing um, as long as you continue to have substrate. <clears throat> so this particular um, teeter-totter, <clears throat> if you will, <clears throat> if we just think of we have plenty of substrate and plenty of enzyme. So think of P as the enzyme, the protein enzyme. L is the substrate. As long as there's plenty of substrate and plenty of enzyme, the reaction rate can continue to proceed towards the formation of products, and we can see an increase in activity. So if we were gonna graph this, as long as there's plenty of enzyme and as long as there's plenty of substrate, reaction rates can increase. And okay? so reaction rate can increase as long as we have enzyme and substrate. We talked earlier, though, that there can be a plateau. There can be a maximum rate or a saturation point. If you run out of enzyme, it doesn't matter if you keep increasing the substrate, you can only go as fast as the number of enzymes that you have. Additional substrate will not increase the reaction rate if you have equal amounts of substrate and enzyme. So typically you're in a reaction sort of equilibrium, if you will. You've reached a maximum saturation point there's equal rates, you know, going forward or backwards. Um, this is uh, talking about the law of mass action. I'll talk about that more in a second. But the idea is that um, there's a point at which you can't change the amount of substrate and make the reaction go any faster because you hit that saturation point. So additional substrate doesn't make it go faster. So I talked earlier that if you want to control the rate of a reaction, you're going to have to change the amount of enzyme within the cell. So really the rate of a reaction is proportional to how much enzyme you have and how much substrate you have. The directionality of the reaction depends on law of mass action or what we call Le Chatelier's principle. So a lot of reactions in the body are what we call reversible. So in this example, you can see we have a reaction going forward and we have the reverse reaction going in the other direction. At equilibrium, it's the same rate forward as it would be uh, the rate going in reverse. In this example, part C here, when we have an increase uh, in the amount of substrate available, we can see the forward reaction uh, moving. And then eventually we'll get back to an equilibrium state again. So by adding more substrate. But what if you had a situation where you had more products and you see the reverse starting to take place? So for example, if you have carbon dioxide and water and you see the forward reaction taking place, so the formation of carbonic acid, 
that would mean that there's more carbon dioxide in water. So you have more in substrate currently, more CO2, more water, and we're driving the reaction to the right. That is the law of mass action or Le Chatelier's principle. When you see an increase in the substrates, you have this enzymatically catalyzed step. The enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. So you have this enzymatically catalyzed step and we end up producing more products. But what if there's more products? If this reaction is reversible, what if there's an increase in the amount of carbonic acid? Then what we would see is we would see the reaction proceeding in the reverse. And so the reaction would start to proceed towards the production of water and carbon dioxide. And so we would say that the reaction is proceeding to the left. <clears throat> so when there's an increase in substrates, we saw the reaction move to the right. <clears throat> when there's an increase in product, we see the reaction moving to the left. And the enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, can catalyze both reactions. And so it depends on the law of mass action or Le Chatelier's principle. That's going to determine if we're moving forward or if we're moving <clears throat> in reverse. What are some other things that can affect enzymes? <clears throat> well, it turns out there are cofactors or coenzymes <clears throat> that can affect enzymatic activity. Uh, cofactors are typically uh, metal ions. They're inorganic ions. Uh, things like calcium, magnesium, uh, zinc are good examples. <clears throat> and these um, metals, these metal ions, these cofactors, uh, can actually adjust the conformational shape of the protein, they can change the protein in such a way that it makes it active. Uh, essentially, they can induce the fit, if you will, of the substrate uh, to the active sites. Uh, and so it may, the cofactor makes the enzyme more functional. Cofactors typically participate in temporary bonds uh, with the enzyme to allow the substrate to interact uh, with the active site. And so that's seen in this example here where the cofactor is interacting with the enzyme. So this is the enzyme, the inactive protein. And so it's making it functional by now having functional active sites that then the substrates, they're using ligand in this example. So ligand and substrate can be interchangeable. So the substrate is interacting with the active site and it's because of the assistance of the cofactor. <clears throat> Another example would be something like this <clears throat> where we have <clears throat> the cofactor and it's interacting with the enzyme. It's changing the shape of the active site <clears throat> uh, just enough so that the, uh, the substrates, so these are the substrates, can come in and bind to the active site. Um, in this lower example, you see that the cofactor and the substrates are actually all coming into the active site together. And again, though, that is assisting the enzyme with its ability to interact with the substrates so that eventually you can produce products. So eventually you would have a reaction take place where you would get products from this. The cofactor is just assisting the enzyme or assisting the substrates in interacting with the active site so that the reaction can actually take place. Coenzymes are similar, uh, but they don't change the active site. So coenzymes uh, typically are going to help the uh, substrates. So uh, a coenzyme, actually that's not the one I was looking for, so we'll just stay on this picture. But a coenzyme uh, is going to help the uh, substrates uh, make their way to the active site so that uh, the uh, reaction can take place. Uh, typically, coenzymes are going to be vitamins. So if you're curious about what vitamins do, so B vitamins, C vitamins, folic acid, biotin, uh, pantothenic acid, there's lots of different uh, vitamins. These vitamins are acting as coenzymes and they're assisting the substrates uh, in making their way uh, to the active site so that the reaction can take place. Another way to control enzymes is something called end product inhibition. 
So in this example, the, the end product of an enzymatic uh, reaction, so this is just generic, A becomes B, B becomes C, C becomes Z, but each step is catalyzed along the way. The final product, so this final product, is able to inhibit enzyme number one. So as you make more of the final product, it can go back and inhibit enzyme one, and then that's going to shut off the reaction. If you turn off enzyme one, then you are not converting A to B, right? You're shutting off that process. Eventually, what will happen, though, is you will then decrease the final product. And when you decrease the final product, you'll lose that feedback inhibition, and then this reaction will pick up again. So A to B will start up again as enzyme 1 becomes active. And then B will become C, and C will become Z again. And as you increase the final product, it'll go back and inhibit enzyme number 1 and shut this down again. So this is a way for us to control metabolic pathways. So it's really a type of negative feedback uh, inhibition. And so the final product in the metabolic reaction is inhibiting some enzyme along the pathway. What this does is it really prevents the accumulation of a final product. You don't want to overproduce something, so we will control how much final product uh, you actually have. Uh, and what it oftentimes can do is it can also result in a shift to produce something else. So if you have divergent metabolic pathways, so jump ahead here, if you have divergent metabolic pathways, what you can see is if you shut off one particular pathway, you can produce more of another product. So if, if this was inhibiting a particular enzyme, it could allow us to diverge and produce more of a product. There are other ways to control enzymes. You can uh, have activation and inactivation uh, mechanisms for enzymes. We do that a lot of times uh, through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. <clears throat> we can produce inactive enzymes, things like trypsinogen and pepsinogen, uh, and then those can become uh, active uh, in the presence of another enzyme or in the presence of uh, some secretion, like in the example of pepsinogen, in the presence of hydrochloric acid, uh, it becomes active pepsin. Uh, trypsinogen is activated by an enzyme called enterokinase uh, to become trypsin. Uh, so we have other ways to control <clears throat> whether an enzyme is functional or not uh, at a given point in time. Uh, we've talked already about enzymes lowering activation energy. <clears throat> I want to just go back and look at that uh, diagram again in more detail. So we had the original situation <clears throat> where it takes a certain amount of energy for substrates or reactants to become products. <clears throat> but in the presence of an enzyme, we can lower that activation energy. So the amount of energy that it takes to get from substrates to products is much lower. So how does an enzyme actually do that? Well, enzymes basically make it easier uh, for these substrates to interact together. For example, CO2 plus water. We learned earlier that that becomes carbonic acid. Well, without the enzyme, this is slow because it's difficult for carbon dioxide and water to have the appropriate orientation to be able to be converted into carbonic acid. But in the presence of an enzyme, so if we have an enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, carbonic anhydrase is going to take the carbon dioxide, the CO2, and it's going to take the water, okay? it's going to take those two substrates, and it's going to put them in the correct orientation. And if they're in the correct orientation, then it takes much less energy for them to react together in order for them to produce the product, carbonic acid. So the enzyme lowers the activation energy by aligning the molecules in the correct way in the active site in order for then the reaction to be much easier. And it's a big difference. When you have carbonic anhydrase, you're talking about allowing for millions of conversions to take place in the matter of a second 
compared to um, a very, very small amount of conversions taking place in, let's say, a minute of time. <clears throat> so it might take a minute for even one carbonic acid to be produced, whereas when you have an enzyme, you could get millions of molecules produced, right? So one million molecules produced in the matter of one second. <clears throat> so it's a huge difference, okay? Enzymes make these reactions so much more efficient and so much faster um, because they're putting the molecules in the correct orientation. <clears throat> the last thing I want to take a look at <clears throat> on enzymes um, is really how we categorize different enzymes um, and then look at just a little bit on uh, inborn errors of metabolism, so genetic uh, conditions where enzymes fail. So how do we categorize enzymes? Well, this table makes it really simple for you guys to look at categorizing uh, enzymes. <clears throat> you can see that there are various categories listed here. Oxidation reduction, <clears throat> hydrolysis, dehydration, different types of transfer, uh, and then ligation uh, reactions. <clears throat> so when you look at enzymes, <clears throat> typically we know what they do <clears throat> uh, based on their name. So a, a glucokinase probably has something to do with glucose, um, and kinases are a family of enzymes that phosphorylate. So a glucose kinase can phosphorylate glucose. So the names actually help us figure out what they do, but categories help us figure out what they do too. So if there's an oxidation reduction category, then we know these types of enzymes are involved in oxidation reduction reactions. <clears throat> what does that mean? Basically, it means that molecules that gain electrons go through what's called a reduction <clears throat> process, or they are reduced. Molecules that lose electrons are oxidized. <clears throat> and so we have different enzymes that can do those things. They can help uh, molecules gain electrons or lose electrons. <clears throat> so if they're losing electrons, it makes sense that oxidase <clears throat> would be in the name for that enzyme. <clears throat> so if you're looking at an oxidase uh, enzyme, you know that it's doing an oxidation reaction. It's helping molecules lose electrons. <clears throat> if it's reducing something, a reductase <clears throat> right, would be a good example. So reductases help molecules gain electrons. Uh, and so you can see that when you look at the naming uh, of molecules. So if it's a dehydrogenase or an oxidase, uh, those are uh, basically oxidizing uh, reactions, whereas a reductase uh, is an oxidizing type reaction. So, sorry, a reductase is for reduction. It's a reduction. Oxidases are for oxid oxidizing reactions. <clears throat> so you can use the name <clears throat> to figure out what the enzymes are actually doing. <clears throat> How about hydrolysis um, and dehydration reactions? Same idea. <clears throat> These are reactions where you either are gaining or losing water. <clears throat> so in dehydration synthesis, you are losing water in the process of combining molecules together. <clears throat> in hydrolysis, you're using water to separate them. <clears throat> and so there's different names that you will see. <clears throat> For example, in dehydration synthesis, you could use a word like dehydratase <clears throat> to indicate that you're talking about a dehydration synthesis uh, reaction. <clears throat> in hydrolysis, you might see names like lipases or peptidases, <clears throat> these actually use um, water <clears throat> to break proteins, peptidases, or break lipids, lipases. <clears throat> so you get the uh, idea where the name of the enzyme might actually help you <clears throat> and the category it falls in might help you with what it actually does. <clears throat> Addition, subtraction, exchange reactions, pretty self-explanatory. If you add a functional group to something, it's an addition reaction. If you remove a functional group, it's a subtraction reaction. In an exchange reaction, you're taking one functional group from one <clears throat> substrate and you're putting it onto another substrate. So you're exchanging from one location uh, to another. So, for example, in a kinase reaction, a kinase is an exchange reaction with phosphates. What kinases do 
is they take a phosphate from ATP and they put it on to say a glucose. So you have a glucokinase where you have basically um, exchanged the phosphate from one place and put it on to uh, another place. Um, addition reactions uh, where you're adding something. So maybe you're adding a phosphate, so a phosphorylase, right? adding a phosphate or an aminase. It adds an amino group. Uh, subtraction reactions, a phosphatase will remove a phosphate. A deaminase will remove an amino acid. And so you could see how you can use naming to help you and categories to help you understand what enzymes do. And then lastly, li uh, the ligase category or ligation reactions. This is where uh, molecules are joined together using ATP. So it requires not only the enzyme and the active site, but it also requires energy uh, from ATP. So there's a great example. Uh, it's called an aminoacyl tRNA synthetase uh, enzyme. And this is a ligase uh, enzyme. And what it actually does is it uses ATP. <clears throat> it uses ATP <clears throat> to add amino acids to transfer RNA. <clears throat> so you have transfer RNAs. They kind of look like this. R the RNA is bent <clears throat> into this structure. <clears throat> so it's a single stranded structure, <clears throat> but it's bent to form this shape. And we need to be able to add amino acids to the transfer RNA. So there's this large enzyme that allows this to take place. And that is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And it requires the amino acid to be in the active site. It requires the transfer RNA to be in the active site. But it also requires ATP. So it takes energy as well. So in order to join the amino acid and the transfer RNA together, it needs to be in the presence of ATP. And so that puts it into the ligation uh, or ligase category. The last thing for enzymes that I want to take a look at is this idea of errors in metabolism or essentially genetic uh, defects. So there are lots of genetic uh, defects that can happen. Uh, we have lots of genes, and not all genes uh, work properly in every human. And so uh, those genetic defects can lead to uh, errors that take place. Uh, and oftentimes they're errors in metabolism that lead to pathology. So an error in metabolism can actually lead to pathology. Uh, for example, you might be familiar with pathology. You might be familiar with Tay-Sachs disease. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease uh, is an inborn error of metabolism. It's a genetic defect. Um, it affects lipid metabolism in the brain, and uh, it, it's going to lead to death early on uh, for um, an infant that has inherited uh, Tay-Sachs disease uh, from their parents. The examples I want to show you are from a metabolic pathway that is linked. So I can show you actually three different inborn errors of metabolism uh, just by looking at this one uh, metabolic pathway. So when you have inherited defects in genes, that can lead to errors uh, in metabolism and it can affect uh, products, either not products not being produced or it can lead to accumulation of substrates that normally should have been uh, broken down through a metabolic pathway. Uh, for example, if you are lacking enzyme number one in this particular pathway, uh, you have a condition called phenylketonuria. Uh, it's actually a recessive disorder, um, and it is affecting uh, this hepatic enzyme, this liver enzyme, and it causes the accumulation of phenylketones. So in essence, you have an increase in phenylalanine, and those uh, phenylalanine um, amino acids are then accumulating in the body and they are becoming phenylketones 
which actually can lead to mental retardation, um, seizures, uh, and, and uh, depressed uh, neural development uh, in those that have uh, this particular inborn error of metabolism. However, if you are aware of this early on, you can decrease the amount of phenylalanine that is ingested uh, by somebody that has this uh, phenylketonuria and you can limit the overall effects. So you would have to have a dietary change in how much phenylalanine you consume because you don't have this particular enzyme to help in phenylalanine metabolism. Um, another condition is when you lack enzyme number five in this metabolic pathway. Uh, this condition is known as alcapto, uh, alcaptouria, so spelled alcaptouria. And alcaptouria is also a recessive disorder, and it results in the accumulation of homogentistic acid. So you're not breaking down homogentistic acid effectively. And what happens is this causes cartilage uh, damage, heart valve damage. Um, it can lead to kidney stones. Uh, so we can see a whole host of symptoms uh, as this homogentistic acid builds up uh, in the body, all because you're lacking uh, enzyme number five due to a recessive uh, genetic defect. And then lastly, uh, if you're lacking enzyme number six, this leads to a condition known as albinism. Uh, albinism is a condition where you do not produce enough uh, melanin. So this condition is not based on accumulation of something, but actually the lack of production of something. So there's a decrease in melanin production. Um, and melanin is the protein uh, that helps protect our DNA against UV radiation. Uh, and so it, it's the darkening of our hair and skin and eyes. And so in albinism, you don't have that. And so when you lack that protection, you can see things uh, like a higher prevalence of skin cancer, uh, melanomas. Uh, and so um, it, it's important that somebody uh, that has albinism protects themselves from the sun so that they don't have uh, that pathology. Um, all of these conditions you can live with, but you do have to make adjustments so that uh, you don't suffer from the symptoms of not having these particular enzymes. And so these are inborn errors of metabolism, uh, and they have to do with not producing a, a particular enzyme, which leads to pathology. So that was a lot on enzymes. I hope that helps. Take care.